So next we're going to focus on uh, GI health and uh, the gut microbiome. And our, our first uh, speaker is Dr. Cindy Davis, and she's the Director of Grants and Extramural Activities in the Office of Dietary Supplements. In this position, she actively engages and encourages partnerships with other NIH uh, National Institutes of Health Institutes and Centers to facilitate funding um, in the area of, of, of dietary supplements and of relevance to, to their mission. And she is also actively involved in a number of the, the government working groups on the microbiome. So Cindy's going to talk to us about diet, microbiome, and health. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. What I'd like to talk about is the gastrointestinal microbiome and its interaction with diet and nutrition and how this can affect health. So here's my outline. I'd like to first give a little quick overview of what exactly we mean when we talk about the microbiome. How does it vary over the lifespan? What is the evidence that diet can influence the microbiome? How can the microbiome influence the response to dietary components? And finally, what is the relationship between diet, the microbiome, and disease risk? And because this conference is focused on healthy aging, wherever possible, I'll try and use examples related to longevity or related to increased health span. So what do we mean when we talk about the human microbiome? Well, we're actually considered um, mega-organisms. And that's because we're a combination of many different species. In addition to our human or eukaryotic cells, we also have bacterial cells, viral cells, fungal, and archaeal cells. And while there's a lot of discrepancy about how many more microbial cells there are than human cells, estimates range from either equal number or up to 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. When we talk about the microbiota, we're talking about all the different microorganisms living in a specific niche or a specific environment. So the gut microbiota is all the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract. And in fact, that's about 100 trillion organisms. When we talk about the microbiome, it's their collective genome. And in fact, there are about 100 times as many genes as the human genome. You might hear the term metagenome. And that's a combination of both the microbial genes and the human genes. Or you might hear the term metagenomics, which is an analysis of the genetic potential of both the mammalian and the microbial cells. So what do microbes do for us? Well, they provide the ability to harvest nutrients. They produce additional energy, otherwise inaccessible to the host. A good example of this is the fermentation of dietary fiber to short-chain fatty acids. They produce vitamins such as folate, biotin, and vitamin K. They metabolize carcinogens such as the heterocyclic amines formed in food during cooking. They prevent colonization by pathogens. And they assist in the development of a mature immune system. This slide shows the development of the human intestinal microbiota over the lifespan. I won't talk at all about the newborn because Dr. Donovan will present this in the next slide. But only to say that the initial gut bacteria will depend on the delivery mode. In early childhood, you start having new strains appearing, and there's a rapid increase in diversity. Adults have a highly distinct, differentiated microbiota, and the elderly start losing diversity. And that's actually shown better here. In infants, there's a lot of variability and limited diversity. By the time a child is about two or three years of age, the microbiota is very similar to an adult. During pregnancy, you have a large increase in diversity, but afterwards it goes back similar to the regular adult. And as you get older, you start having a decrease in diversity. Well, can the microbiota be associated with longevity? This was a very interesting case control study in one of those pockets of people in Italy with extreme longevity that we heard about earlier today. But in this study, they compared the microbiota in people 22 to 48 years old, 65 to 75, 99 to 104, and a group of 24 people 105 to 109 years old that were considered healthy. 
And what they found is in these healthy, extremely elderly individuals, there was an increase in a number of subdominant taxa that appeared to be associated with health. And these included acromancia, bifidobacteria, and Christen senilacea. But this was a cross-sectional study. So we really don't know whether this change in microbiome was associated with longevity or whether they actually, it showed up earlier in life because of other dietary and health habits that led to their increased longevity. So we really need to do longitudinal studies to see are there changes in the microbiota that are associated with healthy aging. But let's assume they are. And if that's the case, the next question can be, is there any way that we can modify the microbiota to increase health? Well, there is some evidence that we can have dietary modulation of the gut microbiota. Examples include probiotics, which are foods or dietary supplements that contain live bacteria that have been associated with health benefits. Prebiotics, which are non-digestible food ingredients, which selectively stimulate the growth of gut bacteria, usually lactobacillus or bifidobacterium. Examples include inulin and other oligosaccharides, lactulose, resistant starch, and certain types of dietary fibers have also been shown to have a prebiotic effect. Symbiotics are a combination of a probiotic with a prebiotic. The whole idea is that the prebiotic ends up being an energy source for the probiotic to stimulate its growth. And in fact, many different food components, such as the polyphenols in tea, cocoa, and wine, have actually been shown to serve as energy sources for bacteria and stimulate the growth of certain types of bacteria. And spices. Actually, spices have often been used for food preservation because they inhibit the growth of many different types of bacteria. So this slide shows in a mouse model that continuous probiotic exposure actually increased longevity in this model. They took 10-month-old female mice, and they were either fed a chow diet and gavaged with a specific um, species of bifidobacteria as a probiotic or a vehicle for 11 months. And they can found that those animals that got the probiotic had a significant increase in longevity, despite no change in body weight. And this was mainly due to a decreased tumor incidence and a decreased ulcer incidence. When they did a molecular analysis, they actually found that it was due to increased production of polyamines, which was associated with decreased inflammation. But I would not take these results to suggest that giving a probiotic to humans would actually lead to increased longevity. Kind of to put the study in perspective, the probiotic was given every single day. Meta-analysis in humans show that probiotics in general do not colonize the gastrointestinal tract, that they do need to be given continuously. And to be honest, everyone has a different microbiota composition to begin with, so you don't know which probiotics are going to benefit which individuals. There's also evidence to suggest that prebiotics may increase um, longevity. This was from a very interesting hypothesis paper where they actually looked at the health effects of dietary restriction and the prebiotic high amylose starch, or HAS. And the whole idea is when you looked at many of the health effects associated with dietary restriction, except for longevity, which hasn't been studied, high amylose starch has the exact same biological type effects, leading to the hypothesis that perhaps this prebiotic may also be associated with increased longevity. There also is evidence that I, suggest, that I suggested earlier that many of the dietary polyphenols can also influence the microbial composition. In this study, um, we actually gave pigs different doses of cocoa polyphenols, cocoa flavanols, and we found that those pigs that had the highest amount of flavanols had an increased number of bifidobacterium in their feces and increased amounts of lactobacillus in their colon. Moreover, the cocoa powder consumption decreased TNF-alpha and toll-like receptor 2, 4, and 9 gene expression in intestinal tissues, which is an anti-inflammatory effect, which is actually showing a biological effect of these changes. In fact, there is some very strong evidence that extreme changes in diet can affect microbial activity in gene expression. In this study, they took 10 subjects, and they gave them either all animal products 
or all plant-based products and looked at the microbial composition. And I know that this um, table is pretty, this figure is pretty complex, so I just want you to focus on this part and look at the red and look at the green. The green is the plant-based and the red is the animal-based. And what you can see is that all the red tend to cluster together and all the green tend to cluster together, suggesting that the diet was actually more important than their genetics in terms of influencing their microbial composition. And this idea that diet might actually be more important than genetics is not limited to just one study. This is actually a study from animals, and you don't normally think of going from the human studies to the animal studies, but it highlights really the importance of diet. In this study, they took five inbred and more than 200 outbred mouse strains, and they were fed either a low-fat, high-poly, high plant polysaccharide diet or a high fat, high sugar diet, and they looked at the microbial composition. When they did a principal component analysis, you can see that all the high fat, high sugar diet go together and all the um, low fat plant polysaccharides go together. And when you actually look at the microbial composition, when they were on the LFPP diet, they had increased amounts of Bacteroidetes, whereas when they were on the HFHS diet, there was increased amounts of Firmicutes. So they are showing that, in fact, diet is more important than genetics in terms of influencing the microbial composition. Well, I've talked a bit about the, how diet, how the microbes, both the numbers and type, can influence how dietary components can influence the microbiome. But this is actually a two-sided relationship, and we need to realize that the microbes can also influence the response to dietary components. In fact, bacteria can generate new metabolites for many different dietary components. A number of foods and their bacterial metabolites are shown on these slides. Often these metabolites are more biologically active, and many of these have been, the metabolites have been associated with health effects. And because of the limit on time, I'll just focus on two of these, fiber and elagic acid. This is a summary table from the World Cancer Research Fund, where they looked at the relationship between dietary fiber and colorectal cancer in all of the cohort studies. And what they found was that every 10 grams intake in dietary fiber was associated with a 10% reduction in the risk of developing colon cancer. Moreover, there was a dose-response relationship. So what is the relationship between dietary fiber and cancer? Well, as I said before, dietary fibers are fermented by colonic bacteria to form short-chain fatty acids, including butyrate, propionate, and acetate. Butyrate is the most widely studied and the preferred energy source of colonocytes. Butyrate has differential effects in normal versus cancer cells, and I'll show that in the next slide. And moreover, you can't just do human studies of butyrate, because if you try to feed butyrate, it would all get absorbed in the intestine. So you actually have to give dietary fiber and look for the production of butyrate. This cartoon shows the relationship between dietary fiber and colon cancer. As you all know, there's both soluble and insoluble fiber. The insoluble fiber actually increases the colonic transit time so that there's less time for the colonic cells to be exposed to carcinogens. But the soluble fiber is fermented by the microbiota to short-chain fatty acids. In normal colonocytes, butyrate is a preferred energy source, so they'll absorb the butyrate and they'll use it to increase proliferation because it's being used as an energy source. However, in cancer cells, you undergo something called the Warburg effect, and they start actually using glucose as a preferred energy source. So if the cancer cells are using glucose for energy and they're exposed to butyrate, they can use the butyrate for other biological effects. And one of those is as a histone deacetylase inhibitor, and so you actually have decreased proliferation and increased apoptosis. Probably one of the most interesting studies looking at the relationship between dietary fiber and bacterial diversity came out earlier this year, where they found that when animals were fed a high, fat di high fiber diet, there was a lot of microbial diversity. If they stayed on a high fiber diet, they maintained that diversity over a number of generations. However, if they were on a low fiber diet, they reduced this diversity, and as it, they went subsequent generations, on the low-fiber diet, they decreased the diversity more. Moreover, if they had the low-fiber diet and were switched to a high-fiber diet, there was some recovery. 
However, in subsequent generations, there was a less ability to recover this microbial diversity, saying that you actually are losing specific types of microbes. And why this is important, and I don't have time to go into it, but one of the hallmarks of most gastrointestinal type diseases or diseases that the gut microbiota is linked to is decreased diversity. So if you, anything that you can do to promote diversity is probably going to have beneficial effects in terms of health. Another important dietary component that's metabolized by the gut bacteria are the elagitanins. These are polyphenols that have elagic acid in them. They've been shown to be anti-inflammatory. These include sanguine H6, which is in raspberries and strawberries, penducogen, which is in walnuts, and vescalogen, which is in aged oak wine. And what all of these have in common is they can be hydrolyzed by the gut bacteria to elagic acid and then metabolized to form the urolithins, urolithin A and urolithin B. And in fact, there's a large inter-individual variability in the production of urolithin after exposure to um, foods containing these um, polyphenols. In this study, they took 10 healthy humans and put them in a crossover study where they were fed either strawberry, raspberry, red wine, or walnut, and they looked at the production of urolithins. And as you can see, just looking at strawberries, there was a hundredfold difference in the production of this metabolite, or I should say in the excretion of metabolite. And what this means is that there is large inter-individual variability because of their different microbial composition, and that means that these same foods can have different health effects in different individuals. Well, I've been talking a lot about beneficial dietary um, components that are metabolized by gut bacteria, but in fact, there's also the flip side of the coin, and that in fact, the gut bacteria can metabolize certain dietary components to adverse components. For example, there's a relationship between dietary carnitine in meat, or dietary phosphatidylcholine, which is in eggs or cheese, and they can be metabolized by gut bacteria to trimethylamine, which is metabolized in the liver to trimethylamine oxide. And in fact, the production of trimethylamine oxide has been associated with heart attack, stroke, and death in a number of epidemiologic studies, as well as in well-conducted animal studies. And mechanistic studies have been shown that it's related to changes in cholesterol transport. But you know, it's easy to look at a single nutrient and think about the relationship between that nutrient, the microbiome, and disease risk. In this study, they looked at the, and that in fact, we may need to be looking at nutrient-nutrient interactions. In this study, they looked at the relationship of L-carnitine to um, trimethylamine oxide, and they fed mice four different diets, either a control diet, a diet supplemented with carnitine, carnitine and allicin, or the chow and allicin. And for those of you that don't know what allicin is, it's one of the sulfur compounds that are present in garlic. They fed the mice these diets for six weeks and then gave them a carnitine challenge and looked at the production of trimethylamine oxide as well as my, uh, microbial metabolites in the specific gut bacteria. And I'll go through this quickly, but the important thing to notice is if you look at the plasma TMAO, the orange or the animals given the carnitine were significantly higher than the animals given the carnitine and allicin which are shown here in yellow, suggesting that you can have important nutrient-nutrient interactions. The consumption of allicin was protective against the production of the trimethylamine oxide. And this isn't just um, limited to allicin. There was a recent study about six months ago that looked at resveratrol, and saw that resveratrol had the exact same effect, and that perhaps this is somewhat explaining the French paradox, where you can have the high consumption of meat and red wine, yet it can be protective against cardiovascular disease. So how can diet be contributing to human inflammatory diseases? Well, in fact, the Western-style diet that's high in fat and low in fiber can alter the gut microbiota, and this can influence the production of short-chain fatty acids and lead to gut inflammation. This can have effects on GP um, protein-coupled receptor signaling and histone deacetylase activity and gene transcription and changes in inflammation, gut permeability, and immune regulation can contribute to many of the diseases that we see. 
So I hope I've convinced you that there's a dynamic relationship, that both the numbers and types of microbes, as well as specific dietary components, can influence microbial metabolites, and this can have an effect on disease risk. So the question is, is how do we actually use this information to try and think about dietary interventions to promote healthy aging and promote health? And in fact, there are two different strategies we can use. In the first strategy, you compare healthy individuals compared to those with the disease, and then we use the multi-omics based analysis. And what I mean by this is a combination of metagenomics along with metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, metabolomics. We look at the data integration, the metabolites, the genes, and we generate hypotheses. And we test these hypotheses in relevant uh, models, whether they're cell culture, organoids, or animals to elucidate the mechanisms, and based on our understanding of the mechanisms, we can try and do clinical studies, be them drug trials or intervention trials. But there's also a second approach, and the second approach is if you take individuals, you give them a dietary intervention, and you start noticing that some people respond and some people don't respond. And then maybe we can do computer learning to integrate differences between the responders and the non-responders to try and predict in an independent cohort who might respond and who might not respond. And then we can subsequently test hypotheses that we might have doing the mechanistic studies. And in fact, the second approach was recently studied in what I believe is probably one of the most important papers related to diet and the microbiome. And in this study, they realized that you could actually use the microbiome and information about it to make personalized recommendations for diet and glycemic control. And I'll try and go through this quickly because I know I'm out of time. But pretty much they had 800 subjects, and when they tried to predict their glycemic response on the same foods, they realized that there was a large amount of variability among individuals. So what they did was instead looked at how they responded to different foods in terms of their glycemic response and included information about their gut microbiome, specific blood tests, questionnaires, anthropometrics, and put all of that together into a computer model to try and predict how do we think individuals would respond based on all this different analysis, particularly the microbiome, and then validating it in a cohort and then doing a dietary intervention study. And what they found was that there was high interpersonal variability in post-meal glucose observed in the 800-person cohort, that using personal and microbiome features enables accurate glucose response prediction, that the prediction is accurate and superior to common practice in an independent cohort, and moreover, that the short-term personalized dietary interventions successfully lower post-meal glucose. So what this is really saying is People respond differently to the same food, and different foods will have different glycemic responses in different individuals. And really, the future of diet and microbiome research and personalized nutrition is really the integration of all of this to try and say, can we make personalized recommendations for diet and disease prevention? So in the future, when we think about and we sit down for meals instead of our traditional view, we want to take a metagenomic view of our dinner plate and think of all the different microbial metabolites that we have from the food we eat. When you sit down to dinner tonight, realize that you're not just feeding yourself. You're also feeding the millions of microbes in your gastrointestinal tract, and what they desire might be different than what you desire. And I'll finish with this cartoon, and remember that bacteria are your friends. Thank you.